everybody. How are you? You'd think uh, growing up about an hour away from here, by the crow, or as the crow flies in Rochester, New York, I would remember that it's cold during March, but I didn't bring any sweaters with me. So uh, maybe a note for the speaker kit next time. <laughs> Just joking. Um, I, should have, I should have known better for sure. Uh, but it's cold out there. If you guys noticed. So yeah, um, thank you, Henri. I appreciate the intro. Um, I will get into, uh, I mean, this whole talk is actually predicated on, a lot on that blog post that Henri was mentioning. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about is something that I like to refer to as hyper-lightweight websites, or hyper -lightweight web websites to get it to fit on this slide. Um, so my story at YouTube, I was a web developer. I was a second full-time web developer at YouTube back in 2007. Um, they had a, actually, a very sophisticated engineering team, but not that many web developers, obviously. My boss, who was the first full-time web developer at YouTube, started three weeks before me. So um, we did not have that much. Uh, when we first started out, there wasn't a whole lot of web sophistication there. So we got to have the unique opportunity to do a lot of that work uh, for Google at the time. And it all started with this one conversation. So at YouTube, we would have these, these architects who would sit down in like, the cafes and have these um, sort of debates with people. And one of the architects uh, said this. He said, if they, if they can build an entire Quake clone in less than 100 kilobytes, why can't we get YouTube to load in under one megabyte? And I was like, oh man, that sounds awesome. Like, could we, how do you do that? Like, YouTube at the time was weighing in at like five megabytes. And, uh, and that's just to get the video to load. Right? That's all the JavaScript, all the image content, the thumbnails, all that stuff. So that became my challenge. I was like, oh man, I'm going to do this. Um, I don't know if you guys know much about uh, the Bay Area, but Google is about 20 miles south of San Francisco, and I live in San Francisco. And so there's a, an hour-long bus ride you take every day to get down there and back, right? So this was my time to work on this project. It was on the bus. And what came of it was this project called YouTube Feather. Um, YouTube Feather was a hyper-light version of YouTube. Uh, it was uh, designed to serve the video as fast as possible with no other constraints, particularly. Um, we wanted to maintain about 80% of the user experience, so I got to throw away a lot of stuff. You know? I could look at different pieces of like, advertising and just say, we're not going to do that. Um, we were going to use the latest technologies, so we weren't going to presume that we are going to serve all like 99.5% of the users on the internet. We were just going to serve the people with the modern technologies, which at the time was basically iPhones, the first Android devices, and uh, you know, internet browsers. Like the iPad came out in 2010, so even that was too new. And the goal, one of the goals was to make as few requests as possible. And so one of the results, or the, the results were actually pretty astounding. Uh, it was 98 kilobytes for everything but the video when I got it all baked down into its base components. We were able to do it in 14 total requests from three domains. Um, and it was also my first opportunity to pull in my other side project, which was the HTML5 video player. Um, so I got to work on that project as well. Uh, so basically building uh, the HTML5 video spec was coming out at the time. We got to work on that as well. Uh, it was based on CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, HTML5. So I got to plug that in, and that's what actually got us under that hurdle of one megabyte. Um, <clears throat> and speaking to that blog post, it opened up new regions of the world, which is one of the most interesting things that came out of this project. We were able to uh, reach sub-Saharan Africa, uh, rural parts of India and rural parts of China, parts of South America that we couldn't reach before because it would take 20 minutes to load the page. And now it was taking two minutes, which seems insane when you're in Toronto and you have amazing you know, internet connectivity, but in those parts of the world, it's very, very slow and very, very um, inconsistent. The internet may be up, it may be down, there might be power, there might not be power. So this was actually really interesting and it actually threw us for a loop. We, couldn't we didn't really know why, when we rolled this out, our aggregate latency numbers actually went up. And the reason it went up when we looked at the, geo, uh, the geography of it all was that um, people were using YouTube for the first time. So instead of them not using YouTube, now they were using YouTube and they were dragging our numbers in the wrong direction, but it was actually a positive. 
So that's like an important thing to remember. Like we're not all in you know metropolises with great Wi-Fi and great internet. Um, but in fact, we still have high latency environments everywhere, even to this day. Like the thing that scares me to death is this: go go internet or <laughs> airplane Wi-Fi. I'm sure you guys have experienced this at one point or another, but it's pretty awful, right? Like it's terrible, um, and every website you try to load is, is going to be pretty slow. And it's inconsistent. It drops in and out. You know, you hit some cloud cover. It's actually the perfect metaphor for the rest of the world. So try out your website on GoGo in-flight Wi-Fi and, and see how it goes. So as part of this, um, so Feather was sort of the first time I or built this process or, or worked through this process of designing a hyperlight website. And it's something that I've done many, many times over and over. And my hope today is to kind of show you some of that process and something you can adapt to your own needs and whatnot. Um, but what it fundamentally is, is it is a reconception of a web-based user interface designed purely for performance. Like you get to throw away every other constraint and every other thing you're thinking about for the most part just to focus on performance. And that will give you a baseline to evaluate the rest of your website against. Right? Like, there is no such thing as zero latency. Right? So there's always going to be some latency. There's always going to be some cost to delivering your website. And you want to find that lowest cost possible so you can measure against it and try to find the pieces that are costing you the most. And so that's what I'm going to walk us through today in this presentation. And so the metaphor that I like to use, um, and there's a car theme to this for no other reason than at the time I was shopping for a car. Um, but we're trying to build a Formula One car, right? We are trying to build a, a race car. You can't drive that thing to the mall. You can't pick your kids up in it. Um, you, you cannot uh, actually drive that on the street. You need special gravel, and you need special tires, and you need all these special things. But it does allow you to push the limits of performance, right? These are the fastest cars out there. And that's the metaphor, right? And so you need to understand that this is not meant to become your website. This is what you're using to kind of measure what's possible with your website, and then try to dial it back and figure out how to get yourself somewhere in between these, right? So let's walk through the, the steps to doing this, the steps that I, I, I do to do this. So here it is, the goal, as fast as possible. We just discussed this, but it's, you want to get as roughly consistent with the real thing as possible, so you want it to, to look and feel just like your website would otherwise look and feel. But you want it to be perceptually indistinguishable, but it may be very distinguishable under the hood. Not to use a pun, but. <clears throat> so the first thing you want to do is identify the most active page on your website. So at YouTube, for instance, I don't think most people would know this because you probably picture it as this giant you know, behemoth of a website, but there's really only two pages on YouTube. There's the search page and the watch page. So the video view page is what we call the watch page. And so those are the two pages you should focus on. And in fact, the search page is actually pretty, pretty fast already, right? So the, the one that we focused on was the watch page. And it's very likely that if you are running like a prototypical website, you probably only have a few pages that are just used a lot, right? So if you're an e-commerce website, you have a product page and a search results page. If you're a blog, you know, a blog site, you probably have a, a feed page and a blog post page, right? So find the one that is the most actively used it's a blog post, it's probably the blog post page. If it's an e-commerce site, it's probably the product page. Um, and you're going you're gonna to select that one, you're going to build a new version from scratch that is this hyperlight version. So you're going you're gonna to take it down to the studs, you're not going to reuse any of your infrastructure for the most part, you're just going to build it up from the ground up. And you're going to basically, you're going you're gonna to work from HTML to CSS to JavaScript. Right, so try to do all, as much as you can in HTML, then do as much as you can in CSS, and as much as you can in JavaScript. Assemble it all into one hyperlight HTML page. We'll talk about some of the techniques for doing that shortly. Um, put it behind a, a simple CDN. You, know, you can do CloudFront or Fastly or Cloudflare or any of these. Try to get it behind a CDN so you can see you know, things like um, uh, compression and pipelining work for you. I don't recommend for this kind of a project Try to spin up your own HTTP2 pipelining. It's a lot of work. Um, let the pros do it. Um, and then you're going to measure both that page 
uncached and the hyper lightweight page uncached as well. See how fast they load. And then analyze the results. And that's the big part here is that you want to build a model that you can analyze against. So there's a couple of things that you should do, you should keep in your hyperlight version, your baseline. You should keep real content. So no lorem ipsum dolor content, no, no fake content. Try to use the, the physical content like coming from an API because that's how you're going to load the content no matter what you do. So uh, if you're using you know, H or XML HTTP requests, XHR stuff, uh, you should pull that stuff in um, as you would otherwise. You should keep responsive layouts. So if you're serving to an iPad or iPhone, you should make sure you provide some affordance to those devices as you would otherwise, because these are real use cases, right? Um, everybody looks at the web on their phone for the most part these days. So make sure you're supporting that to some degree. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be uh, completely uh, change around your whole UI. It could literally just be things shrink effectively just so that you can maintain that user interface uh, in the, the smallest amount of code. In some cases, you should do things like spriting to cut down on the number of uh, image requests that you're making. And I'll talk about that in great detail a little bit later. SVG, I'm a huge fan of SVG. Whenever you can use SVG, it compresses really well, especially if you sprite it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so it's very important if you can, if you can do SVG for non-photographic uh, assets, do SVG. It's significant. It cuts down on, on latency costs tremendously. And then accessibility. Um, we have to make sure we pay attention to accessibility. It has to be included in there. You have to make sure that your UI functions for everybody because that's you know, critical for uh, serving your user base. So if you know your user base, and a user base is the wider internet, make sure you're putting in affordances for accessibility. Now we get to talk about the things we get to throw out. So this is uh, something that I like to do, just because, now keep in mind, this is just for the purposes of this baseline, because this allows you to understand what things are gonna cost you later. Because there are trade-offs we're talking about here, right? If you're running a business, that is like ad driven, you have to have ads. So that's just a reality. It's a financial reality. It's a, a matter of physics. So in this case, we just want to know what those ads cost us because if they're costing us more in sort of page load and, and um, you know, download times and it's costing us users, that cost may exceed the value the ads are providing to begin with. So you have to make sure you're paying attention you know, to that as well. And the way to do that is to actually cut out the ads for this baseline and then look at how much they actually cost you later. CMS integration. So this is, again, a similar thing. If your business is like, if you're providing uh, um, content media, you know, you're a Guardian or you're a New York Times, uh, there might be some value in having a CMS integration that allows your editorial staff to edit the article content that you have, right? And that usually requires you to have some embedded code, some JavaScript. Uh, we're not going to do that in this example. Right? That just is not a use case we need to, to satisfy because we're just trying to target the end user. Uh, JavaScript libraries tend to be pretty heavy and they allow you to do a lot of um, nice things. We're going to throw most of those out as well. Uh, we basically just need some simple uh, XML HTTP requests if we want them. Um, otherwise, we're going to try not to use them. The browsers have a lot of stuff built in, as that quote, if you can read it, um, kind of indicates. Right? A lot of companies now are, are going library lists for some of this stuff. Um, CSS layouts via frameworks. We're going to use all the latest and greatest CSS, right? There's some really cool stuff out there. Um, you may or may not be aware of a lot of it. There's stuff coming out every day. I'll leave it to other people to kind of work through some of those because I have some of them in here, but there's always new stuff coming out. Um, we're going to not use ex established frameworks. A lot of those frameworks are built at a time when we didn't have access to these CSS capabilities, and now we do. So we're going to use the new capabilities and throw out the frameworks. Um, we're also not going to do lazy loading of content. That is a complicated process. Um, we're going to instead load all the content in one payload, or as much of it as possible in one payload, and leave the lazy loading till later. Uh, lazy loading is an effective way to cut down on, on uh, bandwidth sent down the wire, uh, unless it's needed. But a lot of people take advantage of that. A lot of websites take advantage of that to just ship more content. So we're just going to put less content into our web page 
rather than lazy load a lot of content in. So a good example of this is at YouTube. On the watch page, we start with 20 videos in the um, related video section, and then you can load more. And if you scroll, it'll load more. Uh, in the feather example, I cut that to five, because that's all anybody would ever see anyway. So, and that just ended up being a performance benefit. Just ship five related videos down the wire. That's all anybody needed to see to keep using YouTube for the most part. Data URIs. So data URIs are not inherently compressible. They're not very easily compressed. So we're going to try to avoid them. They seem convenient in some sense. So that means, if you're not aware what that means, it means plugging like an image into the image source tag directly um, via a data URI. Uh, they are about a 33% hit or increase in, in length to put those into the HTML page itself. We also aren't going to do JavaScript and CSS compilation. Again, um, I believe that, or having done this a lot at Google, uh, JavaScript and CSS compilation is a, a performance benefit for sure, but it also allows you to put a lot more stuff in there that you don't actually need. So again, we're trying to get rid of stuff. We're trying to just ship as few bytes as possible to deliver one user experience. So we're going to cut that out. And then web fonts. All the designers in here will probably hate me for this, but the web fonts just aren't that necessary a lot of the time. And so they are expensive. They're big. Uh, they don't compress particularly well um, because there are a lot of glyphs. If you can isolate it down to a few characters, that's awesome, and I would recommend doing that. But for the purposes of this example, we're just going to use out-of-the-box fonts. So let's take you through this example. Whoops. So again, I was saying, I was in the market for a car. I'm not a big car person per se, but just I was in the market for a car. And I was curious about like, how, what, what the modern web looks like. So I was looking at a, company, at a, at a site called Car and Driver Magazine. And apologies, I should have slid that up a little bit. Um, and I was just curious, like, what, is it, what does it weigh in at? I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty cool website. I was looking at it on a plane. So I kind of felt some of the performance headaches. But I was like, oh, this looks like a clean, modern website. What's under the hood? So this is what we have. Uh, 101, 181 requests from 50 domains, and the total content size is 8.7 megabytes. And this is what their website used to be like. They've done some updates, so I will talk about that in a minute. Um, but it would take 5.9 megabytes just to get that first page hit to load. Now that's not a lot if you're talking about using cable modems and you know fiber optic cabling and all that kind of stuff, but it is a lot when you're on GoGo in-flight Wi-Fi. Non-image content was two megs. That's huge. Like normally, you think a website like this would be predominantly image content, but uh, a third of it is is just the non-image content. So stuff that's like HTML, JavaScript, CSS is two megs, and that's after, that's compressed, right? That's pretty insane. Um, image content four megabytes, and then this is a number that I always pay attention to: is like what are you actually paying for, right? So CDN, a content delivery network. It's, it's what you're usually paying for if you're one of these websites. So of all of that content, the first party content, five, five megabytes per page load. It's a lot. It can add up very quickly. Um, and now here's the, the most interesting thing is the response times, right? So I timed this out. Uh, 2G is 22 seconds just to get it to start showing up, and almost three minutes to get the whole page to load on a, a legacy 2G uh, website or uh, platform. Uh, 3G, 6.4 seconds, 53 to 53 to load the whole page, and then on a high-speed modem, it's 1.5 seconds to 16 seconds. So you can see the disparity here, right? If you are in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm not sure why you'd be on CarAndDriver.com, but um, like 22 seconds just to get it to start doing anything—that's a long time, right? And then get it three minutes just to get that page to load. Now you want to look at a, an article on the page. It's going to take you another three minutes. You'd abandon immediately, right? So it's not good. So I built a hyper lightweight version. This is the hyper lightweight version. And here's the original. So you can see there's some subtle differences. The web fonts probably being, being the most. There's some, um, some subtle shifts in some of the spacing that's just more me missing some of the calculations a little bit. But you can tell this is basically the same web page for the end user, sans ads, right? <clears throat> so like, what, is this, what does this end up being? 
So I got it down to 32 requests in two domains. That's a pretty big improvement. Uh, 1.1 megabytes of total content. So that's an 87% or 87 decrease in content. And only one meg built by the CDN, so your costs improve. So that's really cool. Now here's the most interesting thing. The performance on a 2G goes to 773 milliseconds to get it to start loading something. So that's realistic, right? It's like pretty fast, uh, 425 milliseconds. So less than a second to load in, in every environment that's up there. So that's a huge improvement, and only 11 seconds. So if you look at the 2G, it's 11 seconds to get it to fully load, whereas it would take 22 seconds to just get it to start painting anything in the previous mode, right? Or in the, in the original mode. And I, by no means I'm taking any credit for this, but sometime in the last month or so, they launched a new version, or they made a bunch of these changes to actually improve their performance. So I figured, let's measure that and talk about it. So they made some improvements. This is the new website, image front and center. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a pretty aggressive <laughs> truck right there. Um, so let's see how they're improved, uh, stacked up. So they did some interesting things. They actually increased the number of requests <laughs> um, and domains. I, I, I haven't really spent enough time um, analyzing that to figure out where they're all going, but I imagine they're going to marketing trackers and ad platforms and all that fun stuff. But they did get some improvements. They actually cut the amount of total content. Um, I can tell you for a fact they weren't gzip compressing before, and I think they are now. So uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but gzip compression is actually pretty important for HTML, and JavaScript, and CSS. Uh, that's just a, that's a layup. They should have been doing that if they weren't already doing it. Their total transfer went down by more than half, or actually about equal, almost, yeah, more than half. Um, their images stayed about the same. That's okay. I mean, they actually put a bunch of more images on the web, website, so it works out to be a, a net positive. Um, actually, I'm sorry. They're, they're non-images. They uh, put a lot more of it, but they actually have... Uh, their, their image content, they did decrease to match more what I was doing. Um, so they, they did increase the number of images, but they did uh, apply some better compression and other techniques to get those images to load uh, about equal to what I was doing in the hyperlight stuff. And of course they cut their, their, build, their build amount. And you can see here their actual increase in performance. So they cut their 2G performance by about a th uh, between a third and a half. Uh, or I should say it's down to about a third or a half, depending on if you're looking at paint or fully loaded. And their, and their actual performance on the, uh, the high end is much, much better. So it's 620 milliseconds to 10 seconds. Still pretty bad. There's a lot they could do. But again, they're running a business. I'm giving a talk. <laughs> like There's a very big difference here between um, what our, our uh, motivations are. So let's talk about some of the techniques that go into building a Hyperlight website or techniques that you should apply to your website if you want to get lighter content. So first one that I like to talk about a lot is inline as much as you possibly can. Uh, if you've worked with these like uh, server-side frameworks, uh, I personally like a, a technology called Tornado. This is Tornado. You know, you can use whatever. There's all sorts of Rails and Python and all that kind of stuff that you can apply, Node. Um, and so, but the key thing here is inlining instead of linking. Uh, can't do that. It's not, it's not valuable to do that across you know, your entire website most of the time. It's better to have an external file that you load once and then link into a bunch of different pages. But for the purposes of this, we want to get that down to one resource as much as possible or get, get most of our UI content, our, our non-image content, into one resource. So we're going to inline it. That's what we're doing here. So we're just basically taking our style sheet and dumping it straight into the page. Creates a bigger page, but ends up compressing really nicely. So you can see here, that's the inline statement. This one's kind of obvious these days, uh, but if you aren't using HTML5 semantic elements, you should be. They have a lot of um, you know, UI components and things in, intrinsic to them that help you get to a better user experience faster. 95% uh, of users have access to these elements, so you should be using them. It's pretty straightforward. Now we're getting into some more 
uh, interesting thing. So if you aren't aware, but root M sizing um, will help you get to a relative layout. So people, if they hit zoom in, zoom out, uh, you should use, you know, this would actually allow them to resi resize your website responsively. If you measure everything relative to the root M size, and what that is is the font size at the root. So HTML has a font size set to I like 16 because it divides really well. Uh, and then you measure everything off that initial font size. So whenever somebody hits, you know, command plus or command minus to do the zoom, zoom in, zoom out, your website should respond res responsively just intrinsically. So it's an easy way to get sort of free responsiveness in your website without having to do breakpoints and all that stuff right out of the box. 96% of users support that. The next one is probably the one that I'm the most excited about. It's not that new, but it is pretty new. And if you're not using it, you should be. CSS grids. Like, CSS grids can cut down on the amount of HTML you have significantly. Um, they also make your UI so much more responsive. 87% of users have access to CSS grids currently. And by far, this is the, probably the number one thing that I did in this particular example to decrease page weight, just using CSS grids. Um, pr prior to that, there was the Flexbox, similar effect. You should, use, you should use either of these technologies, whichever you're more comfortable with, but I highly recommend uh, looking at the CSS grids, and there's a link uh, at the bottom to Google's Material I.O., which you can use to kind of learn more about grids if you don't know about them already. This one is, I was kind of surprised, is, is as supported as, as it is, HTML templating. So building templates into your header or into the head tag of your HTML so that you can then copy that using some JavaScript and then duplicate it into your page on page load. It's actually quite fast. Um, this is the code to do it. So in this case, if we were loading in a bunch of articles, we could actually um, inline or, or XHR some JavaScript documents, JSON documents into the page and just map them into templates on the client. Uh, it's a pretty effective way to get a lot of content like article content or list content to render into your page uh, without having to use a ton of JavaScript. 89% of users support HTML templates. Now this one is a little bit interesting. Um, so a friend of mine taught me or showed me this and it's, it's very clever. Uh, you can use t the targeting, the target selector from CSS, which is a little hash mark that goes into the URL whenever you change states on the page uh, to actually affect UI and content on the page. Uh, so you can actually get things to show like search boxes and stuff like that or, or different um, page transitions to show up by using the target selector in CSS. Now, there's a caveat to that. At the moment, the fragment identifier, which is that little hash mark that gets set in the, your, your browser URL, uh, will get added to your browser history. So you only want to do this if it's a significant page transition that you're doing without changing the actual, um, you know, page, or the actual HTML request. So this is Useful if you're like looking at products and you want the person to, be able to navigate through a bunch of products. You have those products loaded into a single uh, page web app, and you want them to be able to go back and forward over those products. But it is not particularly useful if they're just showing and hiding a search box, which is the example I just used, which I shouldn't have used. But 96% um, of, uh, of your users support this now. So definitely think about that. It does make hiding and showing UI, especially if it's significant UI, much simpler. Replacing SVG with HTML and CSS. This was a big win in this particular example. So this is a piece of UI, uh, which is the paging UI for the main article content. And I was able to replace it uh, using SVG, HTML, and CSS. It was a bunch of images before. And they weren't even sprited together. So uh, those images were about five kilobytes. And now they're one kilobyte. And then they're probably even smaller because those uh, SVG elements are actually compiled into an SVG sprite sheet, which is, I think, the next item we'll talk about. Uh, and that actually makes it even smaller. 93% of users have access to SVG and spriting. Or, I'm sorry, SVG. So this is SVG spriting. So <clears throat> what we're doing here is we're creating one SVG element with all of our icons, all of our graphics inside of it, and then we're referencing pieces of it throughout our web page. So 
So if you're not aware of what spriting is, it's, it's, it actually originates in like gaming, computer games like Mario. Uh, you have this big block of memory that contains all of your image resources or image data, and you just kind of create a little window over top of it and just pick out that piece of it to show on the screen, right? So you get to have one block of, of visual media information that you select pieces and chunks out of. And it means that in the web world, you only have one resource that you're operating on, uh, which is very, very, which cuts down the number of requests, cuts down the number of uh, uh, loads that you have to do and decompresses of, an, like, say, an image. So it's very, very useful. So I highly recommend doing this. In fact, um, this is, an, again, that, like, between HTML templating and this, I think these are the two biggest wins that I was able to find. 91% of users support this. So this brings us to another topic, which is the, the image-based spriting. Image-based spriting is when you take a bunch of images and you combine them into one single image. Now, this isn't particularly um, new. This is actually something a lot of companies have been doing for a very long time. If you look at the Google logo on Google Search, I think it's still a sprite. You can see all of their little icons load up. Um, again, it allows you to compress everything into a single response, compress it all together into one uh, response. The, um, the issue here is that we actually, HTTP2 pipelining is actually probably the more modern, better way to do this. So if you're unaware, HTTP2 uh, has this concept of pipelining where once you establish a connection to a, a particular host, you can send multiple resources down the wire because historically in HTTP1, if you're loading, say, 10 images, each time you load an image, you have to negotiate with that host to basically load the image or to get it to deliver the image to you. And you can actually short circuit that using HTTP2 pipelining. So image spriting is not as useful uh, as it once was if you support HTTP2 pipelining. However, um, if you are doing a bunch of mobile application development, loading a single image is usually better than loading 10 images. So spreading them still has that value, uh, even if it is HTTP pipelining. Uh, the reason is the way that images are loaded into memory on the mobile devices. So um, Facebook has invented or has created a bunch of libraries to help you do this kind of stuff uh, to, to avoid the cost of having to load and switch contexts in the devices like GPU and stuff like that. 96% of users support this. Um, now one that's near and dear to my heart, responsive images using SourceSet. So, um, as Henri mentioned, uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Imagix. We do image processing as a service, uh, specifically to solve this particular problem, which is having a high-resolution image asset that you want to serve in a multitude of dimensions uh, to your customers, and you want those to be responsive. So you want them to be able to be delivered to the device uh, as the device is indicating that it wants that image delivered. So, Historically speaking, we would create 10 different sizes of an image. So you're an e-commerce website and you have a product photo of some shoes and you want to show those shoes on, in a multitude of ways. You want to like create a thumbnail, you want a, a product shot. You would actually just create those 10 images in Photoshop and save them to a bucket somewhere. Unfortunately, nowadays, we have so many devices, you can no longer predict where, why, and how those images are going to be used. So the better way to do this is to store one high-resolution master asset and then use a service like Imagix um, to to resize, scale, crop, manipulate that image based on the request from the browser or the request from the user. And one of the ways you can do this is in this example, you can see we have, in this case, our, our particular host name, which will make images, uh, let me back up for a second. The way that we work is we will connect to your existing bucket, say an S3 bucket, You've loaded your images, your high-resolution master images into an S3 bucket. You tell us how to connect to that bucket. We give you a host name back, like this one. This is car and driver, CND, meaning car and driver, uh, .imagex.net, which will link directly to your images. So if you want to get to a Honda.jpg, it would go right. To, it would connect directly to your S3 bucket, pull the Honda.jpg, and serve it through us, right? All through a CDN as well. Now the cool thing is you can add these parameters. Like in this case, we're going to set that width to 200. We're going to change the format to a progressive JPEG, highly recommended. Uh, we're going to support uh, auto formatting, which means it will actually 
negotiate with, say, Chrome and deliver a WebP if WebP is available. Uh, and then it'll also do some compression uh, that we drive. So we do some perceptual compression, things like that, automatically. And that's just off your original master image, which is usually megabytes and megabytes. We turn it into the kilobytes that you want. And because it's responsive, we can actually put this into the whole source set and do things like change the DPR of the image so that you can now serve multiple DPRs, multiple image sizes, uh, all to, you know, without having to store multiple versions of that image. So this is actually very useful because it enables you to serve the least amount of image bytes to your users as necessary. Um, and that's not, just a, that's not just a plug, it's just literally like how you get faster. Like if you look at the image content, um, if you looked at the image uh, content sizes before, it was the most notable uh, shift in, or decrease in page weight. Focus on the images. And 88% of responsive images, or 88% of browsers support source set, so you should use it. The gzip compression. So this, we're starting to get into, there's only about two or three more of these that I can recommend at the moment. Um, but this is a big one. Uh, gzip compression, if you're not doing this. I know that a lot of web developers are, are very front-end focused and not necessarily back-end focused, but this is a critical uh, option you should turn on or get your DevOps people to turn on. Because uh, if you forget to do this, it's very expensive. So what gzip compression does is it, it's an old school compression algorithm that takes text and like deduplicates it and stores it uh, in a deduplicated form that you can then reverse and get the original form back. And if you look at HTML code, it's a million tags that are duplicated over and over again. And this is why things like SVG are so powerful, is because they're just the same you know, values copied over and over and over again. You have thousands of tags, but they're all the same tag, you know, or there's like maybe 20 tags you're using. So the gzip compression works really, really well on this kind of content. So you should turn this on at every opportunity that you can. Key thing, uh, whether it's you or your DevOps people, Make sure you vary on accept encoding in your caching layers. Otherwise, you could be sending gzip content to people who don't support it, which is very rare these days, but uh, it's pretty destructive to their user experience because they just get a download. They don't actually get your website. So make sure that happens. But once you do that, I mean, 99% of users nowadays support gzip compression. It's pretty cool. In a similar vein, Google released Brotly. Brotly is a new compression algorithm. You should experiment with it because I was shocked. <laughs> I didn't realize that this was as supported as it is nowadays. But if you can, if you have the sophistication to support Brotly, and again, this is a server-side thing, uh, you should do it. Uh, 84%, oops, sorry, 84 of users support Brotly out of the box right now, which I was shocked by. I mean, it's so new, and yet, it's every, anybody who has an Android device can take advantage of this right now, as far as I understand it. So, and that gets even better compression than GZIP. If you want to get really small, use Broadly. HTTP2 pipelining, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but make sure that as you're delivering this content, it's HTTP2, I'm sorry, HTTP2 pipelining. And what that means is, again, we are using, you know, here's, here's how you check, make sure it says protocol H2. Um, and what that does is you can see on this bar on the right-hand side, uh, Everything has been pre-negotiated, so there's no hit. After that first hit, there's no real hit to, the, uh, to have to negotiate. Everything goes down the same pipe. It's pretty powerful. And 84% of users use that, or support that now. So the whole point of doing all of this is to be able to measure the output that we've gotten, right? So I showed you the results already. We got a significant amount of um, performance benefits from applying these techniques to Car and Driver Magazine's website. Uh, I'm going to show you quickly one way of measuring it. Um, I use site speed. Um, you can also use web page test. I don't care what you use. It's more about the activity of actually measuring what you're doing. Um, so this is an example of just what a, uh, a site speed report will show you. I use site speed just because it, I can do it locally. And it will actually deliver you know, some basic, or some actually very detailed measurements on what's happening on this web page, like how many domains are being loaded, what are first party versus third party. You can slow it up, you can speed it down according to which uh, network conditions you want to support. Yeah, so use one of these tools. 
This is essential. What you want to be able to do is create a baseline, measure it using these tools, measure your existing website against it, compare the two reports, and make decisions off of them. And so in this case, on Car and Driver Magazine, and this still remains the case, um, I found the biggest part of the website that needs to be improved. It's kind of ridiculous. It's 600 kilobytes to load this basic UI where you select a car to go drill down into more article content. Um, those are all individual high-resolution PNGs for some reason. Uh, they could benefit tremendously by spreading them together uh, and like compressing them properly and using responsive images. That would cut 550 kilobytes out of their web page right off the gate, right, right out of the gate. And if they did an SVG sprite, which I had our designers do, um, it gets down to about 15 kilobytes for all that UI. So that's a significant performance savings. And that's costing them real money. I mean, you got to remember there's like millions and millions of people hitting this website every day, and their bandwidth bills are probably, you know, <coughs> in the tens of thousands of dollars a month. So they could cut back tremendously by just optimizing this one piece of code. So, last slide. Um, the key thing here is to make this a process that you run constantly, right? Building a hyperlight web website or web page is, is a process that should take about a day. It's not something you should invest a tremendous amount of time in. You should be able to do this kind of work very quickly just to get a baseline. Again, you're throwing a lot of the concerns out the window. Um, you should be able to do this on other pages as well um, if they're important pages to you. Uh, but the, the concept is to build this into a process to deliver the measurements that you want to see, compare the measurements, and then evaluate what steps you need to take. So repeat the process. Um, repeat it consistently with the current page that you're working on. Repeat it with other pages. Um, and then one of the things that this is what led Feather to become a thing is that uh, we ran a 1% test. We actually put a 1% of our traffic through it, and that's where we started to see those latency numbers change. And which is very valuable to us because that actually informed the next like five years of web development uh, on how what we were doing and how we were thinking about it. We created new frameworks, we created new approaches to serving the watch page. Um, it changed a lot of the reasons that we were doing things the way we were doing them. So definitely try to get some traffic in it. I would not recommend putting 100% of your traffic in it, obviously, because it's going to not meet all of your end users' needs. But if you can isolate your end users in some way and serve 1% of them, which 1% of YouTube's traffic is a lot of traffic, um, it's, it's valuable. Using this information, you should build a performance budget. So how much are you willing to trade for one thing versus another? Like I said before, ads, you're serving ads, you should understand exactly how much those ads are costing you before, your, to your end users before actually putting those ads on your web page. <clears throat> and then do this regularly, like constantly be re... re uh, reforming your, your performance budget, like reinforming your performance budget. So figure out exactly you know, what your metrics are, how they've changed in the last month or so. Uh, you can do this with a tool like SiteSpeed or web, web page test, but if you can even get to a point where you're constantly reevaluating those numbers, like automatically, uh, you can really, really hone in on what's costing you the most money and how to save uh, for your end users. So that's basically it. Um, I have some source code up if anybody wants to see it. Uh, the live demo, I believe, is still up um, on hlw.chrisacros.com. I'll verify that. Uh, but yeah, um, I only have one minute, so I'm probably not going to be able to take questions, but I'll be around if anybody wants to chat or uh, connect. Um, I'm here until about 4 o'clock today, and then I have to fly back. Uh, but definitely say hello. Love to talk to you. So thank you. <laughs>